I have a couple of videos here about Hollywood movies in particular. This one's from Vulture. The decomposition of Rotten Tomatoes, the most overrated metric in movies, is erratic, reductive, and easily hacked, and yet has Hollywood in its grip. He goes on to talk about basically the uh, 2018 a movie publicity company called Bunker 15 took on a new project, Ophelia, a feminist retelling of Hamlet starring David Ridley. Critics who had seen early screens and published 13 reviews, seven of them negative, was translated to a score of 46 on the all-important aggregation site Rotten Tomatoes. Disappointing outcome for a film with prestige aspirations and no domestic distributor. But just because the tomato meter says that the title is rotten, scoring below 60%, it doesn't need to stay that way. Bunker 15 went to work. While most p film PR companies aim to get the attention of critics from top publications, Bunker 15 took a more bottom-up approach, recruiting obscure, often self-published critics who are nevertheless part of the pool attracted by Rotten Tomatoes. Another break from standard practice, several critics say Bunker 15 pays them $50 or more for each review. These payments are not typically disclosed, and Rotten Tomatoes says it prohibits re reviewing based on a financial incentive. In October that year, an employee of the company emailed a prospective reviewer about Ophelia. It's a Sundance film, the film that has been treated a bit harshly by some critics. I'm sure Sky High expectations were the culprit. So the teams involved would like, or would feel like it would benefit from more input from different critics. More input from different critics, not very subtle code. And their prospective critic wrote back to ask what would happen if he hated the film. They replied that, of course, journalists are free to write whatever they like, but that's super nice ones. Are, there are more critics like this than I expected, often agreed not to publish bad reviews on their usual websites, but so to instead quarantine them on a smaller blog that Rotten Tomatoes never sees. I think it's a very cool thing to do. If done right, the trick would help ensure that Rotten Tomatoes log positive reviews, but not negative ones. He goes on and talks about, first off, this isn't surprising. I'm sure this happens a hell of a lot more than this. You know, people getting paid to give films good reviews. You know, they're, they're going to try to game the system in any way they can. Hell, we see it all the time. There's people not even being paid, especially with, like, the user score, user, or, you know, the, the viewer score is not that kind of shit. I'll link it in the description box. It goes on quite a bit. I mean, there's a lot to this story. It goes on and on and stuff. And, you know, I read it. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's interesting, but it's not very surprising. Anyway, I got a story here from BuyingTheComics.com, kind of tied into that, but, you know, kind of not just movie-wise. Ava DuVernay says racism and sexism to blame for audiences being more excited about Oppenheimer than her Isabel Wilkerson biopic origin. You know, which, of course, you know, has nothing to do with the fact that people know who Oppenheimer is. They don't really know who Isabel Wilkerson is. So it's your job to, you know, lead the charge to tell people about her. But also, Christopher Nolan is the director of Oppenheimer. He's well known for making... You know, big time films, very successful films. Ava DuVernay, no, nah, not so much. So, you know, but of course, it's it's racism, it's sexism, it's all of the above, isms, phobes, all that kind of stuff. And that's just basically repeating it right there. I'll leave this in the description box. You can read it for yourself. I'm just gonna glance over or gloss over it. Born in '61, works in prep, best known for being the first black journalist to win a Pulitzer Prize for individual reporting, the first black woman to win a journalism Pulitzer. He goes on and talks about, you know. She, she's written books about the caste system in America, and, you know, yada, 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 all that stuff. And, you know, not a huge fan of hers, but, you know, the goal was to try to stitch together, talking about the movie, was to try to stitch together a tapestry to create a quilt. That's how I think of it. And I allow myself to color outside the lines of what I've been told, just to throw that out and tell the story from my gut. And it came from reading this book. Basically, it's a straight-up adaptation of these really beautiful and tragic moments in history. And stuff, and it goes on. It talks about the core pieces of the puzzle or two, the losses that she experienced, and yeah, 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 the very short amount of time, less than two years, in which these losses happened, is true. The fact that she worked and wrote this book, and then a lot of time, yeah, yeah. the film tries to align both stories, personal trauma or cultural trauma. So, you know, it's the usual type of, oh, everything's against me. Now, of course, in this case, it was largely true. I mean, we're talking about in the 60s and stuff. But she's, you know, of course, going to try to talk about how, you know, we have so much further to go, and, and it's just like this now and stuff, and it's, which is complete bullshit. And I always hate when they do that kind of stuff. But anyway, they go on and they talk about, you know, like she was asked a question: What does it take to get the audience to watch a film like Origin? Because midway through, I realized this is a process film, a movie about someone making something. I just had a conversation about she, she said, which I loved, and I was frustrated because I feel like there's process films about women and people of color, people are not as intrigued. Or when there's process films. I don't know that this is a fair question to ask you, but I am curious what you make of the way to get, of the way to get the audience in the door. Because it's complicated when asking people to watch material that is challenging. 
In turn, we may unsurprisingly blame the existence of this challenge on the inherent racism and sexism of general audiences. You're right, it's challenging to watch a process film about a man making a bomb. He's a man who's trying to do something, couldn't quite describe it to anyone else, but he knew it. Isabel is a woman who knows something and can't quite describe it, but she knows it. And she's gonna find it. You'll sit through three hours of his process, will you sit through two hours of her process? And yada yada yada, blah blah blah, black person, woman, yada yada yada. Like I said, I'll link this in the description box. The, the article itself is, is, you know, it's fine, it's well written and stuff, but it's just listening to her talk, it just it makes you wanna, you know, just take a knife to your brain, basically. It's like, come on, everything is racism, everything's sexism. It's like, Jesus Christ, we've heard this story a hundred times. You know, play a different song. But anyway, I've already gone over five and a half minutes on this video. I'll link both these, you know, articles in the description box. You can read them for yourself. Which, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I would, you know, I guess I would recommend the Bound in the Comics story about it. Because it's actually, you know, pretty well written and pretty accurate. The one on Vulture, well written and stuff, but not surprising, you're not really going to learn a lot, but maybe you will, maybe, maybe this does surprise you, yeah, so, you know, hey, let me know about it, the Vulture article is pretty well written too, I, I think, at least in my opinion, but, you know, you can be the judge of that, thank you very much for watching, and have a good one.